Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Shea Station podcast, the newest Mets podcast brought to you by John Boy Media. This is episode seven. The date is August 30th, 2021, and I am one of your co-hosts, Jack. You might also know me as Jolly Olive. Joining me today, as always, is former Mets pitcher, the lefty specialist, Jerry Blevins. And Jerry, you had a tough time last night with your poker game? Is that what I heard on Twitter? I mean, I wouldn't I wouldn't say it was tough. I came out net positive, right? So that's always a win. Technically, you came out net yeah, positive. Yeah, so I think I made like 75 cents an hour or whatever the case may be. Hard working man. But I played for like five hours and I ended up like, you know, it was storming here and my wife's like, I need you home by a certain time because I'm not going to sleep if you're not with me. Which is really sweet. And so for like, the you know, the last round of of games i definitely dumped like most profits and i was cashing out and i was like yeah uh so six and a quarter six dollars and 25 cents is what i was up <laughs> so it was a win and i got to hang out with some of my buddies um which is a win for everybody oh very nice and i did make it home on time good so i didn't even get in trouble so we're you all didn't get in trouble by the wife very nice very nice she wouldn't she i wouldn't be in trouble but uh i also was just like yeah i come in exactly when i say i'm going to and i was, I was gonna ask like how how little does the winnings have to be for you to just be like, I don't want it. Just take it and put it in the pot. I don't care. I mean, that's pretty close. Oh, yeah, like 625. It's about that range. Yeah, but if it, I'm going to always take my winnings and then dole it out. So my brother hosted um, the poker game. He has been hosting. So we went over to his house. And I usually just tip or bring food, you know, a thank you for hosting because it's kind of a a big deal. I drink like 15 Gatorades at his house. So 15? I try to, I mean, I try to stay hydrated. So it's good. Get your electrolytes going. That's right. It's important. It's an athletic sport. Right? <laughs> yeah, no, riveting, riveting stuff happening last night. Well, I got my poker game tonight, so I'll take notes for well, sure. Well, good luck, man. I, I hope you end up positive as well. Maybe even exponentially higher. I would hope. I don't want to come away with like $1. Because I'm, I'm assuming we play with lower entry amounts. So like my would you and I... rather lose $40 or win $2? Win two dollars. What kind of question is that? like forty dollars? Do you mean like, like if I lost forty, was I up at any point or no? I just lost every hand. Yeah. Let's say let's say you bought in for a hundred. Yeah. And you end up with sixty dollars. You might have been up. You might have been down. It doesn't matter. At the end of the night, you either down forty dollars or you're up two dollars. If I had the heights of being up a lot, then I think I would be more okay with it. But I still think I would take the boring game where I go up like five dollars. See, I'm with you on that. A lot of guys, a lot of people that I, I've gambled with over the years don't care. They just want, they're like on the way out. They'll just be like, oh, I only won 50 bucks. Let's put it on black on the way out. Lose it. Oh, well. Oh, well. And then I'm like, I can't live my life like that. I got you. You're a gambling <laughs> man. I, I respect it. Entertainment value. I do. I respect it. It's the same thing. So, so we finally took a series after a 2-11 and 11 West Coast trip from hell. Uh, things were riding high. We got some good starting pitching. We picked up the bullpen when they faltered in game three. We scored a lot of runs, put up 11 hits in game three. And we're going to go through these games, but I'm sure if you're a Mets fan, you know by now that this series win is unfortunately not the story because when is it ever? When is winning ever easy for the New York Mets? The answer is never. But in game one, that was a couple days ago on August 27th, the Mets lost two to one. It was looking like usual Mets stuff. They looked pretty lifeless at the plate. They mustered four hits against Paolo Espino and the Nats bullpen. The lone run coming from a Javi Baez solo home run. He'd hit another later in the series as well. Rich Hill actually had one of his best Mets starts. He struck out eight batters over five innings, only allowed the two earned runs, but that would be all the Nats needed to take this win home. And the bullpen was dominant as usual. Four hit, uh, four innings pitched, one hit, no earned runs, nine strikeouts in this game. So they really uh, were dealing, uh, along with the entire staff as a whole, they struck out 17 Nats batters in this game. It was another fantastic pitching performance for not really, because the Mets only mustered one run. But I think that in game two, they got a lot of juice uh, pumped into them uh, with a big hit from one of their main staying guys. I think that's it. This to me is the pivoting point. This is this is game two. This feels like a momentum builder. This was the one. So in game two, you had Marcus Stroman facing off, coming off a, just an absolutely wonderful year for him. I'm excited for him moving forward. But he went six strong, gave up two earned runs. That runs his total of 
starts with giving up two earned runs or less to 20. It's a stat that is, you know, not meaningless, but it's, it shows you that this guy is a competitor. He's going to give you games where you can win this ball game. 20 starts is an incredible feat, especially coming off of a missed season for him after opting out. Very impressed with him so far this year. Um, this is a game where the Mets fell down early again. They, they were down two to nothing. Um, and then Kevin Pillar came up with two solo shots to keep the game even. Um, Trevor May comes into the game in a tight spot. He pitched really well. Alcides Escobar hit like a one-handed ass out, you know, base hit to, to put runners on the corners. Trevor May's pitching really well. And he just spikes it look like a changeup or a splitty, spiked an off-speed pitch, wild pitch, runs scores. He ends up punching Juan Soto out uh, to keep it to three to two. You can see the frustration on him because he really pitched well and he still gave up a run. You could see him. He kind of screamed on his way off. And I was like, that's pure emotion. That's visceral. That's the kind of guy I want out there on the mound. So I was super impressed with, with Trevor May, especially even though he gave up the run. Um, then comes Michael Conforto up the very next inning, answers three run pinch hit home run uh, to put the Mets up for good. That was the moment for me that felt like the turnaround for this Mets season, for this Mets organization heading in the right direction. A true momentum builder. Lugo Diaz come in and shut it down. But the story of the game for me was Marcus Stroman and then followed by uh, Michael Conforto with a huge pinch hit home run. Coming off the bench to hit is the hardest thing to do in all of baseball and to do it in that biggest style. He went left center, which is like patented, locked in Michael Conforto. And so I think this was a, a case of big sign for things to come. And that, that moves us into game three after a big win on game two. Yeah, a lot of key pieces moving forward in game two that really steadied momentum in the game three. The Mets took game three yesterday uh, by a score of nine to four. Nine is a very welcome sign for this Mets offense. Pete Alonso collected three singles. Jonathan VR had a day at the place at the plate. He also collected three hits. Uh, the offense in total had 11 hits for nine runs. And Tyler McGill uh, sort of got uh, lost in the background of this uh, offensive outburst. He bounced back really nicely for a rookie uh, coming off his worst start in his career. Five innings pitch, two earned runs, just the one hit against the Nats offense, which I thought was pretty cool. Three walks and five strikeouts. So he did enough to hand it off to the bullpen and preserve a Mets lead there. Baez hit an absolute moonshot to left center in this game. Uh, it was a beautiful thing to watch, his second homer of the series. VR homered as well. That one sort of snuck right over the wall. When I first saw it, I actually didn't even think that it was a home run. Uh, but luckily, that snuck over for him, so good for him. I think that's his 15th of the year. So a pretty nice season altogether for Jonathan VR. Uh, four for 11 with runners in scoring position, uh, which is pretty nice. Uh, the game that they won before, they were just one for nine, so that was significant improvement uh, against, you know, a pitcher that has, for some reason, given them a lot of trouble in Eric Fetty, so luckily they were actually able to get to him yesterday. And it was their first series win since sweeping the Nats right before the West Coast gauntlet even began. So it's sort of bookended uh, with Nats series wins, and I think we can finally push it to the wayside and just forget about it completely, uh, especially uh, taking two out of three here. Yeah, I wanted to highlight the in game two, the Mets retired Jerry Kuzman's number 36. Well deserved, long time coming. He was one of the names when I first came to the Mets and I saw some of the some of the posters up. I'm like, hey, another Jerry. I never heard of Jerry Kuzma before. I'm not a huge like I love the history of baseball, but I don't know everything. Um, and he is a name I never heard of. And I looked it up and I was just astonished at the dominance that he put up during his years, especially, you know, in that prime time in, of the, the Mets winning ways. So it's good to see them honor him. A fellow lefty pitcher named Jerry is all, all for me. I appreciate that. I'm for that. And so it was nice to see them uh, put his numbers in the rafters. It's what an honor. Uh, super cool. And I'm glad the Mets fans turned out for him. Oh yeah, for sure. And like Jerry often get, got uh, thrust to the wayside a little bit because he was sort of pitching in the shadow of Tom Seaver, but without Jerry's performances in the 69 world series uh, in game four and uh, stuff like that, you don't get that miracle Mets story. You need Jerry Kuzman behind Tom Seaver. You need that one, two punch that served the Mets so well. I think it's long overdue, honestly. Uh, Kuzman's best years were in the late 60s and early 70s, and I think that the Mets could have retired this number even as early as 2000. Uh, but the fact that we got it up there uh, at the end of the day is a win enough for me. So I'm happy that Jerry is, one, healthy and was able to come to the ceremony in the first place, and uh, two, that it, it happened at all. 
Because the Mets, you know, they kind of have a they kind of have a tough time retiring numbers that I feel like they should. Like they don't come around as soon as I want them to in a lot of these guys. Yeah, I, I'm with you, and it's nice to see. You know, I know Seaver when when they dedicated for him, he wasn't in the best of health um, when they changed. What was the the what road was that that they changed to Seaver Way? Oh, I'm totally done. I can't remember off the top of my head. I, I literally walked it in, but he, you know, he wasn't in the best of health. So he didn't really get a chance to, to come out and get that round of applause from the fans that is deserved. And as a, as a former player now, it's, it's, it would be nice to, to see guys that deserve it. And that meant a lot to an organization come back in a time where they can really appreciate, you know, the kind of adjuration that, that the Mets fans as a whole can give them. And so that was, that was good. I, I really appreciate it. Uh, I'm, you know, I'm excited for, for uh, Stevie Cohen's tenure, because that's a big thing, you know, honoring your former players, uh, former pieces of your organization. It's great for the fans. It's great for the organization. It's great for the future players to see that you can be appreciated um, no matter how long you wear this uniform. And so it's good. It really is. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, we have that Seaver statue coming in soon that he had promised. I'd like to think that he's going to follow up on that as well. And, you know, hopefully that we, we also get to see number five in the rafters at some point soon. I would hope that he doesn't have to wait until he's 70 for David Wright to finally get his uh, number etched at City Field. So I'm hoping that Steve comes through a little bit sooner on that. I think that'll happen. It'll be... Uh... Sooner rather than later, I bet. So, I mean, the captain. Deservedly so. Well, we did have some offensive key performances, which was nice, because usually the key performance is just a starter and then the bullpen, but we actually got to switch it up this week, which was nice. Uh, Jonathan VR had a hell of a series. I think plugging him into the leadoff spot was just some sort of weird spark plug for this team that just worked, and you're at the point in the season where you kind of just need to try things and see how they go, and this seemed to work because they won both games where it happened. So... VR started game two and game three. He pinch hit in game one. Uh, but when he got plugged in the leadoff spot, he was a five for nine, a double, triple, and a home run and two RBIs. And you usually don't see the leadoff guy producing a lot of runs in that capacity. You usually see him getting on base and trying to create runs. But VR was smacking the ball all over the place. So he had a pretty good series. Kevin Pillar also had two home runs in game two. He really fought his way back into the starting lineup, which I thought was pretty cool because he's been also cast to the wayside in a lot of these games, but he had the big hit in San Francisco and he came up big in game two. You don't win game two without PR, uh, Pilar's bat. That's a fact. So VR has been great all year long. Um, he's really been like one of the bright spots all season. He's been super consistent. Uh, I've been really impressed with just his style of play. He's played really good defense, moved around quite a bit. Uh, he's made some blunders on the offensive, like on the base paths, which is, you know, it's not great, but it's part of it, but he has been a spark plug to see him up there. And especially where we are now, where you're, there's not enough ABs to go around for everybody that needs or deserves or wants or feels like they deserve them. And so guys like VR are going to get those because he's been deserved and he's earned it. So it's, it's good to see that, that those things get rewarded. And it's just you're at the point in the season where you really can't wait for these guys to get going anymore. You have to play the hot hands. And I really like that Rojas didn't bite his tongue. He put Pilar back in the lineup the next day. He put VR back in the leadoff spot. I like Nimmo in the two-hole. Uh, also, I forgot to note, a uh, fun little note from Game 3, Brandon Nimmo is the first player in Mets history ever to have two walks and two hit-by-pitches in the same game. So he got on base four times without a hit. But that's just kind of what Nimmo does. And even if he's in the one hole or the two hole, it doesn't matter. He's going to get on base. So I really like having VR at the top, honestly. I kind of want to see them roll it out one more time, uh, even with the Marlins series. Yeah, and I think Nimmo's the – he showed it, like, in his debut. He's the kind of guy that's going to give you his at-bats, no matter when, where, position in the game, time of the game. It doesn't matter. He's going to put his at-bats together. And so it wouldn't shake him up by moving him from the one to the two spot or even in the eight, nine spot. As long as he's taking an AB, he's going to give you his version uh, of getting on base. And so I, I love it. He's versatile in that sense. So use it. Be creative. We need it. So, Jer, we, we won a series. We got to talk about the offense playing well. The pitchers did their thing. The bullpen got picked up in game three, dazzled in the first game. You'd think that this would be a positive episode where we can just rejoice and be happy that the Mets are back on the right track. But as we know, with the New York Mets throughout their history, nothing ever comes easily for the club. Nothing ever goes not scrutinized uh, for this club. And it happened again. 
uh, after Game 3. I'm sure most of you know by now, but we're going to run over it anyway. Uh, in post-game interviews, Javier Baez, sitting with his adorable little kid, uh, was questioned about him and other teammates doing a little thumbs down uh, in celebration for some stuff. Now, normally, I don't, I don't, I like salt and pepper from a couple years ago, but I don't really read into the celebrations. It's just kind of like what the players do. It's kind of how they, uh, you know, reinforce each other and you know give some some positive uh, affection towards each other. But you know, this got questioned because you know why would it be thumbs down? Uh, P- uh, Kevin Pilar and Francisco Lindor were also cited doing this, and uh, this actually didn't start yesterday. This started a few weeks ago now. Uh, it was first spotted in the Philly series. SNY caught it, clipped it, tweeted it out, and noted that uh, it was a new cheer. So this wasn't the first time this was happening. Uh, but Javier Baez, who is you know still getting acclimated to the New York media for sure, uh, was a bit too candid, I think, with his answer. And you know that's not a fault of him. I guess he was being honest. But when you're honest with the media, they're going to take it and run with it, whatever you say. And you have to be very careful with what you say because it will get quoted. The quotes that I have here are, when we don't get success, we're going to get booed. Uh, So they, the fans meaning, are going to get booed when we get success. That's what Baez meant by uh, the Mets throwing up thumbs down uh, to each other when they got big hits. Javi uh, continued to say, I play for the fans and I love the fans, but if they're going to do that, they're putting more pressure on the team. We're not machines. We're going to struggle. And it just feels bad when I strike out and I get booed. We're going to do the same thing to let them know how it feels. Okay, so we're, uh, we're going to dive into other quotes later and all the BS that followed this up. But just from Javi's quotes alone, if this didn't get blown up out of proportion like it has, what do you take from this? Like, what do you take of the cheer? What do you take of Javi's uh, response to it? And what do you take of the media's uh, questioning of it? So here, here's my approach. First of all, it's so ridiculous that we have to talk about it it's not the media's fault that we have to talk about it it's the fact that he said this is why we have to talk about it i think it's silly i don't think it should be news but he made it news so it's our job to talk about it now this doing this whatever it is that motivates you whether you know it's just billboard you know material it's the coach on the other team saying that we're going to try to run because they're uh, defensive line is a little bit soft and then the defensive line sees it and they're like we're gonna use this to play better or it's the the you know Michael Jordan would make stuff up you know about the person that's gonna guard him like he's like that guy said that my aunt is you know her armpits smell bad and so I'm gonna score 50 on him it's just it's just motivation what it, it's a long season whatever it takes this you know this kind of becomes a thing. And then it is a thing. Like, it doesn't matter. You remember the salt and pepper shakers. It it shouldn't be a thing. I guarantee you it doesn't mean to other people what Javi Baez said, but the fact that he said it, that he was like, Hey, you guys are going to boo us when we're bad. We're going to boo you when we're good. How does that feel? Takes your own medicine. Unnecessary. Just shut up, man. Just, just, just hold your tongue be with your teammates, laugh it off because it's not a big deal. Nobody I, outside, I'm not speaking for Javi Baez, but anybody else, Lindor, Pilar, whoever else was using it is not saying, you know, and F you to the fans because we, they're, we boo, they boo us. Like we don't care. It's just a thing that guys are doing. So we do it. If I got a hit on base and we were doing that, I would do that. And my favorite one of all time is like the, the Detroit Tigers back you know, when they were going to the world series, they'd get a hit, they would put their jacket on and then they would straighten their tie. Like this is on that business. Like that's super cool. It doesn't mean anything besides like something to look cool to. I I hate that Javi Baez decided to sound off on it. I respect what he says because that's who he is and that's how he believes it. But I'm disappointed that he has to say, or he felt like he had to say something there because it becomes this unnecessary distraction. Now Lindor is going to have to answer questions about it. Pilar had to answer questions about it. It's pissing a lot of people off, rightfully so. But I don't think it's a big deal. But the fact that he talked about it and then doubled down on it and almost tripled down on it, saying it was something about the fans, makes people upset. And it's unnecessary to make people upset at that point. I I don't think it's a big deal, but you made it a big deal. So, right. 
I think that's a pretty good response, honestly. I, and that's about what I expect from a former player, especially a former Mets player who's dealt with the New York media and stuff like that. And here's what I'll say. So we've had the wave this year, which I liked. We've had the churv this year, which I liked. And we've had the thumbs down this year as their uh, celebrations. I haven't had a problem with any of them. And the first two didn't go explained because either they were self-explanatory or the media just didn't care. The thumbs down obviously raises some questions because, you know, it has negative connotation from the get-go and stuff like that. But with Javi's answering, uh, I just, I keep going back to Rat vs. Raccoon because it's such a ridiculous answer to a question for a crazy scenario that's so obviously a lie to cover it up. And Francisco Lindor did this and it wasn't news in a week. And this easily could have just been like, a, I don't know, we uh, don't want to do thumbs up, we want to do thumbs down. Uh, because we did it once and it worked, and now we just keep doing it. That could have been the answer. It could have been a dumb, veil answer, but it would have worked. And instead, we're we're here, and I just don't understand, like, why you wouldn't lie. You said it perfect. Just just lie. Just make something up. Do so, Say something silly. Say, like, you don't even have to make an answer. Just be like, that's something me and my teammates are doing. You don't need to know about it. You can hop aboard and do it if you want. I guarantee you everything that you think about from doesn't mean what they either said it means or their interpretation of it, like from the player side, all the other celebrations, they're going to tell you something that's politically correct. Whereas, you know, it might mean a little bit of motivation. It might be, you know, the owner spoke out against us in a tweet and this is our slight little piece of rebellion. But whatever it takes to motivate you, who cares? Nobody cares. It doesn't need to be spoken. Somebody asks you, you just make something up that's fine. And then you go about your day. You didn't need to say it. I respect the fact that you voice your opinion, but I have a really hard time when you're going to bring unnecessary scrutiny on your team, on your players. You're going to put your fans in a bad position because now what are they going to do? Like you, you don't, you look, you look ungrateful to be playing a game a little bit. You, you look sensitive and overly so about how the fans react to you. I don't under, I don't personally understand the culture of booing. I never, I won't boo anybody. Um, It's like going for me, it's like going to a concert and the guy stumbles through a, a piano solo and then you boo like it doesn't make sense to me. I would never do it, but I'm never going to tell somebody they don't have the right to boo because they paid money to come see that person play the piano or play baseball. It's personally, just because I disagree with you on a, a political stance doesn't mean I'm going to air you out or think your your point of view is silly. You know, you decide that boo, it's your right to boo. I wouldn't do it, but you can do it. This is the game that we play. I'm not going to complain about it. It's part of what the deal is, but, but just as a teammate, just shut up and allow us to just move on from it. Don't bring in that controversy. It's unnecessary. And it's, there's like, there are, are a couple things that stem from this. One is that we don't know, or at least I don't know personally how Javi, uh, how candid Javi was with the Chicago media. It must've been a completely different ball game. The, the Cubs are very beloved in their town and the Mets are often scrutinized in their town. We know like, I don't love booing our own team, but the fact is when I go to City Field, it's something I hear for Francisco Lindor and Javi Baez. Like it's just a fact of how the team's performed. And you know what? Like this team hasn't played well. They went two and 11 in that stretch. They lost eight one run games. It's, it's tough for fans to swallow, especially after being in first all season. So the fans are bound to get emotional in that way. And if you find a way to respond to that, that helps you and helps your teammates stay focused and clear headed then do it. Like, by all means, I'm, like, not going to comment on it. Just do it. But the fact that you bring such honesty about what that cheer is about creates a problem in of itself. I don't even think it means that to other guys. That's the problem. I don't like, like, you you talked about other, like, tweets. Pilar said, you know, that's not what it meant to me. Like, I've got nothing but love in New York. It's just something that we were doing. Like, it's, I really just think it started out as like, you know, this is a way for us to feel motivated or, you know, just to be silly. It's, it didn't have that deep of a meaning, but Javi Baez gave it that deep of a meaning himself. And now the team is spoken for because Javi already released a quote. That it's legitimately Lindor 
is going to have to have a scripted answer for this and he's going to have to nail it so it can be brushed aside. And it's unfortunate. It really is like a positive thing, but, but what, what do the talking baseball guys say? What do they say? As Metsy as it gets. Yeah. This is about as Metsy as it gets. Like this is an unnecessary piece of just BS that really isn't news that somehow makes itself a bigger deal. And that's why it bothers me because I've been on the other end of it. Uh, it's just a teammate saying something silly that he shouldn't have said that brings undue, unadded, unneeded, unnecessary pressure and scrutiny on the, on the rest of your teammates. And so I appreciate his honesty and I respect what he says because he's being honest. I don't agree with it, but I respect it. But I don't respect the fact that he's going to make his teammates answer for something that he has to say. And so that's that's my problem with it. And it, it, it invites a couple things. One, it definitely makes Javi feel alienated, especially with what we're going to talk about a little bit later with the comments made by the Mets top office there. Uh, it also maybe lessens the chance that he'll want to come back, which I'm sure is maybe on the Mets agenda for the off season. And also it just invites the opinions of all our division rivals and all these random baseball fans in general to just laugh at the Mets, even after winning a series that they desperately needed to win and steadying momentum and waking up the bats. None of it is the story now. The story is a silly little thumbs down cheer. And I'm sure, you know, I'm sure, you know, if I wasn't a Mets fan and I was rooting for maybe the Phillies or the Braves, I'd be loving this. Like, I don't blame them for laughing at us because this entire situation is laughable. It's ridiculous that it's even a story. We had a nice Q&A planned. I posted on our Twitter and Instagram, hey, ask us some questions. It'll be fun just in case the Mets play bad. Again, we don't have to talk about that. We can answer questions. And instead, we're talking about this nonsense. And we're going to spend pretty much the whole episode talking about it because that's just the state of the 2021 Mets at this point. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it's so unnecessary. And it, and I, I just, I don't, and what you, you just, just shut up, man. Just, just, just shut close up. Your mouth. Just <laughs> shut up. I mean, again, I respect your opinion and your ability to be honest and forthcoming, but know the, know what you're trying to do. Well, who is that for? Like, what are you trying to do? Are you trying to like, what, what is the motivation behind speaking like that in that sense? Because it's purely not about your team at that point. That's the problem I have with it. Because none of your teammates want to answer that question. I guarantee you they're going to ask, you know, if Jacob deGrom is available, the, he, they want to hear his comments. And Jake doesn't want to talk about that. Conforto doesn't want to talk about that. But they're going to have to. And, again, that is the problem I have with it. Well, we did get a bunch of quotes from other teammates about the situation. You mentioned Pilar's before. Uh, Pilar said, no, I'm not booing the fans. We're having fun. No different than earlier this year when we were chirving, which is the uh, closed circle with the three fingers. Please don't look too much into this, which I wish other people would do. But sadly, we're way past that point. Uh, Stro also said media is always searching for anything to cause controversy, which is definitely true in the New York media. Uh, stop playing into these narratives. It's all fake BS. We won today. That's all that matters. I agree. On to the next not dwelling in the past. Same mindset we've had all year. Thankful for the squad. So it seemed like they kind of cleared the air. You know, maybe this was going to diffuse by the morning. Maybe this wouldn't even be something that we, me and you were talking about. Maybe it was just another little headline to add on to the list of headlines for the 2021 Mets, whether it's Rat vs. Raccoon or Dave Jow stepping in as manager. There's been plenty of weird shit this year. But then uh, it went from bad to exponentially worse when uh, team president Sandy Alderson decided to release a statement uh, late last night detesting uh, the Mets' behavior, specifically Javi Baez's quote. The one quote that I pulled from this was, the Mets will not tolerate any player gesture that is unprofessional in its meaning or is directed in a negative way toward our fans. And the big reason that I have a problem with this, and I know it's not directly related, but Sandy has stayed quiet on a lot of things this year. Sandy, Sandy has stayed quiet on pretty much all of the Porter situation, uh, the Bauer signing situation, and uh, the Mets' poor performance and sort of left that to Zach Scott recently. But when it came to this, he decided to step up and say something, which I think was unnecessary. I think this is something that could have been dealt in-house. And instead, uh, he stepped forward, gave it a lot of publicity for maybe some fans that weren't active on social media, didn't even hear that it was happening. And it went from a minor story to a major story overnight. And not only that... We have an off day today, so it has a full 24 hours to breathe and grow and get bigger. And I think that him speaking on it 
was just completely unnecessary. And it was like pouring gasoline on a little fire and making it exponentially bigger and more dangerous. So that was an, very frustrating for me, to say the least. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I actually like Sandy speaking up in this moment. Uh, all the other, all the other stuff aside, it's because I know Sandy on a personal level. So all the other stuff aside, all the, all the, the in-house, you know, treatment of female employees, I don't want to touch on that because it, it to me, it, it's a separate issue as far as apples to oranges here. I'm going to speak directly about this. The, the other stuff, I don't want to pretend like it didn't happen or I'm not pretending that it's not an issue because I understand that it is. But for this particular, Sandy is a really good, respectful human being. He's very much old school in that sense. He's a Vietnam veteran, a classy human being, and he's a fan first guy. Like He's all about that fan experience. And so when his you know, his players step out of line, like egregiously, it's like, you know, if Papelbon walked off the field and was like grabbing his crotch to say F you uh, to the fans, it's that kind of thing. And he feels offended and he doesn't ever want people coming to the ballpark to be directly affected by that. And so I like the fact that he said, I, we will not tolerate this towards the fans. You know, you don't, you don't do that. So if you want to voice your opinion and say, you don't like booing, that's fine. Be classy about it. That's the only thing that I appreciate Sandy's approach because he's like, our fans can come here and do whatever they want to do. This is New York city. If you want to boo, boo, you have every right to, and he's correct. You have every right to just because I wouldn't boo. doesn't mean I think that you're, that since you boo, you're worse than me. I wouldn't do it, but I'm not going to take away your chance to do however you want to do it. It's fine. I've been booed. It doesn't feel good, but at the same time, like it's part of what we what we deal with. It's hard to do our job, and that's part of it. That part that's part of what makes it difficult. This isn't golf where you have to be quiet. You know, it's baseball. It's part of it. And so for Sandy to stand, stand up for the fans, to stand up for New York City and say, hey, man, you know, suck it up. Quit being a baby. This is New York. You don't like boo? Play better. Like it's that's the bottom line. And so as much as it did throw gas on the fire, he is very forward about being respectful. And he thought that was disrespectful. And he put his foot down. And I, I respect that aspect of it, too. And I respect you, uh, given the other side of things, because obviously me and you come from completely different worlds of Mets fandom. You know, you were a player for many years. You got to know a lot of these guys and uh, face off with a lot of these guys as well. And you know Sandy personally. So I definitely respect you sort of coming in and giving the other side there. I just think that at this point in the season, with all the different controversies we've had, with all the underperforming players, that minimizing these situations and just focusing on the team performing better was my main goal here and I think that as the hours went on and I just saw more people talking about it leading up to this statement and Steve Cohen's tweet after about him missing the biggest controversy being the black jerseys that it was just lol Mets from every corner and there are definitely reasons why Sandy would have motivation to speak out and I think you highlighted those really well and I commend you for that but I just think that you know minimization would have been my my goal here and instead it's a story and even on a day where the Mets aren't playing baseball they are going to be the story of baseball yeah that's again just shut up man yeah just, just shut, shut up. just it would have been ah uh, it would have been so easy to just been like yeah ah uh. just make something up what do you think what what could this have been it could have been uh i don't it, he did like you said before he didn't even have to answer he didn't have to it would have been you know looked at a little bit off but it would have been looked at better than this it's an inside joke between my friends and or my my teammates and I. We just do this. I it's you. Could, I mean, come on. I don't. I don't. I don't. You just 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 close your mouth a little bit longer. Well, we're in this mess now. As Metsy as it gets. As Metsy as it gets. Unfortunately. <laughs> oh yeah, and I saw I saw Jim and Jake walk out of the studio today before I went in to start setting up, and they just had these big smiles on their face, like, "Hey, how's it going?" Huh? And I walked <laughs> in the office this morning. Freaking Yankees fans. Oh, I know. They're, and like, I, I like at the end of the day, it frustrates me, but I I don't blame them for laughing. I really can't because this this shit is hilarious. This is just so ridiculous. 
Can I say one weird thing about booing? Sure. Uh, I got a chance to play with Bryce Harper for a year when I was with the Nats. That guy gets booed everywhere we go, except for at home. You know, at home, it might, it's different. But he loves it. And he talks about, like, what Barry Bonds' approach to it was. is like, you got to be doing something really good to get booed on the road by another team. And so you feel like you're doing things right. And I think that there's there's room for every type of fan in the game of baseball, as long as you're not being directly harmful, as long as you're not cussing and the kids around you are having, you know, to listen to you being, you know, overly. So again, it's not for me. I always like look at the dad with the little kid standing there and I see him like booing a player directly telling him he's terrible. And this, you know, like eight year old kid is there saying like, all right, that's how I've got to be like my dad. I, I didn't want to be that example. And so that's why I choose not to do it. Um, but again, be you You're This is America. You're, you're allowed to be and do whatever you want for the most part. And so go do your thing. I don't, I don't think I'm better than you because I don't do it. And, and I will never force my opinions on you. And so that's how I feel. This is, this is a freedom world and some people love to get booed and some people don't. So some people, I mean, Harper was a really good example. I feel like he, fe he fed off it really well and he, he does make the perfect villain because of how highly touted he was, how young he still is and how good he is and how much he tortures uh, division rivals whenever he plays them. He loves it. I think Freddie Freeman plays into it a little bit now, too. He's starting to get more He's like, booed I, on the road. I can't boo him and Acuna. I never have. I, they're just way too likable, even though they play for a division rival. like I, just, I, I respect them too much. Uh, I'm with you. Well, so, that was part of our Q&A that we didn't even get a chance to get to. We'll, we'll save it. I want to I wanna apologize to everyone that asked that sent us questions. Hopefully, we'll have time to get to this on the next episode. Yes, thank you very much for sending us uh, some some questions because we do want to get to them. Uh, hopefully, we get to them soon. And if you if you got more, just keep firing away, like individual, specific, whatever it is. And we'll be, we'll be posting again more in the off season too, when there's less current baseball to talk about. So like, we will get to it. We got to come up with a with a uh, a segment name for that. Is it like yeah, the, like a catchy name? The Twitter bag or the mail bag? I gotta I gotta brainstorm. I gotta like sit and meditate. I'll, let, I'll leave you. It'll definitely be some alliteration, double letter of some type. You know me. It's always about the alliteration. Well, what could have been the main storyline from yesterday <laughs> ended up being like the fourth storyline. Uh, Noah Syndergaard, poor guy, his birthday was yesterday. He was supposed to make his second minor league rehab start. And instead, he uh, tested positive for COVID despite being vaccinated. So he was forced to miss that. And he was forced to stay at home a little sick on his birthday. So Noah, we send you our wishes. Hope that you're feeling a little bit better today. Hope that you return to the mound soon and uh, don't have to deal with much sickness anymore. But that was definitely a bummer. But it got cast to the wayside because of all this useless other stuff. So. That's a, I feel bad. That's, you know, he's going through so much mentally and physically, but uh, he's starting to come back. And for that to be, it's probably pretty deflating for, for a human being. Um, so I wish him nothing but the best. I hope he bounces back. I hope he's asymptomatic and doesn't have to worry about, you know, some, some of the severe side effects that come with COVID. So I'm wishing him the best. Yeah. Hopefully it's a speedy recovery there and hopefully we get him back in a couple of weeks, but uh, that remains to be seen. So we do have a series with Miami coming up four games at home. One of them being a double header uh, on the first day, which will be tomorrow. I'm sure this might've gotten forgotten because everything else is, uh, you know, the talk of thumbs down, but uh, we have Taiwan Walker going in game one against a to be announced pitcher for the Marlins. Trevor Williams is going to take game two. Both of those will be seven inning games. Game three, which is going to be on September 1st, that's going to be Cookie Carrasco against Zach Thompson, one of the newest Miami starters who's having a pretty nice year, two and six with a 3.16 ERA. Uh, Thompson actually has faced the Mets before. He gave up three runs in four innings and in his only start against the Mets, so that's a good sign for us. And now uh, Cookie Carrasco coming off his best start, which I was in the seats for, uh, seven innings, two earned runs, plenty of strikeouts, not a lot of hits, no walks. So that came against the best offense in baseball. So I'm definitely encouraged by that. Hopefully Cookie steadies that momentum because, one, I'd love to see Cookie have success to close out the year after such a struggle getting back into things. And, two, you know, it really was like spring training for him, those first few starts, and now I feel like he's really acclimated and really looks comfortable because, you know, when Chris Bryant hit that shot off him, I was there for it. I saw where that ball went. That ball went far, and it got hit hard. And I was ready for Cookie to go two or three innings, sort of fold after that. So for him to go seven was, uh, one, extremely encouraging, and two, showed a sign of a true veteran pitcher there. 
Yeah. And uh, to build off of that, you know, this is a, this is a game where cookie and even, you know, Rich Hill, Taiwan Walker and Trevor Williams can all kind of take advantage of some of the youth that they're putting up there really, you know, study the tape and, and, and get guys that, that jump on first pitch to chase, get guys that, that just take advantage of some of the tendencies that young players and young teams tend to have and really just bury this, this team and, and keep the momentum going and, you know, hopefully get a sweep here. We got four games. That's a big one. You got to take three. Yeah. You definitely have to take three. Yeah. It's tough starting with a, with a double header. That's always, you know, the, a tough way to take both ends of a double header, but we can do it, man. All this momentum that's built off of a, off of a win, you know, maybe having the off day will get guys resettled back in and then, then right into the stuff. Yeah, I sure hope so. And you're not playing at the House of Horrors this time, which is nice. You're not in Miami. You're back home. Uh, and hopefully you can steady momentum from the Nats series. Game four is probably going to be the toughest one to take, in my opinion. It's going to be Rich Hill, who had a good start against Miami uh, when he faced them earlier in the year. He's going against Sandy Alcantara, uh, who is 8-12 and 12 with a 3.27 and has faced the Mets plenty of times in his career already. Uh, he has a 2.79 ERA and eight career starts against the Mets. But there are some bright spots here. Uh, Jeff McNeil bats 353 and 17 at bats against him. Conforto's batting 300 with a couple bombs off him. So there are guys that have plenty of, uh, of experience against Sandy that can go in this lineup. The two that I wanted to note that actually struggle against Sandy are uh, Nimmo and Alonzo, who both bat under 100 with more than 10 at bats. So you're obviously not going to sit them down because they've been your best hitters all season long, but you do have to configure a lineup that hopefully can get one, some experience against them and two, play some hot hands like VR and Pilar. Uh, Alcantara is a uh, hell of a pitcher and he's got some really good stuff and this will be, you know, the, the test and hopefully the Mets don't feel like they need this win because they've lost a couple of games beforehand. Hopefully they can just relax and play baseball and, and let, let their talent win this one. Yeah. I heard uh just play baseball there and it brought me back to the Pete Alonso, just smile. You get to watch baseball. That seems like it was like 18 years ago now with just everything going on now. <laughs> Uh, the the just smile i was like man that's so silly you you probably regret saying that but now he's like all i said was smile i didn't boo that's you. looking pretty good right now honestly yeah that looks like you know like a nice calm hug yeah how, how things change so quickly yeah instead of one of those motions i don't know it's silliness well i'm just here's the one thing i'm hoping for i'm hoping that maybe they have some some 86 mets juice in them and that you know that bad blood with the media can fuel them a little bit yeah, if it, if this is what you need to do to be the best, one of the best players on the planet, then all by all means, do what you got to do. I think I think when it comes down to being in the clubhouse, if you're performing, if you're actually being the best version of yourself on the field, you can be a jerk. You can do. Uh, we can handle a lot of what goes on. If if you better perform, that's what I always talked about with my teammates, especially the young guys like coming up and, and we would talk about, you know, what it takes to kind of stick in the game for a while. And it was one of the things I was like, just be a good teammate, be a good person, show up, be accountable, be on time. This is your job. If you're going to be a jerk, you better be really, really good at baseball because as soon as you're not that good at baseball, they're going to get rid of you because it's not worth having you around. And so I just, it, it encourages you, encourages you to be a better kind teammate. I have no, I don't know Javi Baez at all. He seems like a fun teammate. I think, you know, looking at how much fun and excitement he brings to the game, I, I, I don't doubt that he's a good teammate, but this was definitely a poorly decided move to kind of air out your grievances a little bit and, and bring unnecessary, you know, scrutiny onto your team. But it, it happens. Pete Alonzo said, smile. And that was silly, you know. Somebody threw a dildo at Kevin Pulecki a few years ago <laughs> and it got stuck. <laughs> You know, Let's shit go. happens. I'm it's so glad you brought that up. Dildo gate, man. Wasn't it TJ Rivera's, if I remember correctly? I think it was TJ Rivera's. Yeah, but it was TJ Rivera had the the crown, uh, the belt or the crown. I can't remember what year it was, but then it was taking the picture. And then in the background, it was in Kevin Pawecki's locker, which was hilarious. It's <laughs> it's so funny. I, I yes, I get asked probably once a month, like, who who's dildo? Who was that? Who did it? I'll never tell. I was instructed to ask you, but I'm not going yeah. to. By, by who? I can't say. Yeah, you can. I'll tell you, I'll tell you no, that I don't know, or I will tell you the truth that you'll never find out because some things 
our better left kept secrets in the clubhouse. You can always tell me off air. Just saying. Eh, it's not going to happen, my friend. All right. I, I thought I would try anyway. So <laughs> I love uh, the book Ball Four. Have you ever read it? I have not. So um, it's a good book and there's a lot of stuff and it's really, it's a fun read about a guy coming back, you know, trying to make a play, but, or trying to make a comeback. But he says a lot of things in there that I'm like, dude, why are you, you're revealing some secrets. You're, you're giving them a peek behind the curtains and a lot of people love it. I've been asked a few times if I'm ever going to do something like that, but I would never reveal secrets like that because it's not mine to give, you know, as funny as it is that one of my teammates had a giant dildo or two that got thrown at, in, a, in certain directions and ended up in a locker. And it, it was a guy that had to answer questions about it that had nothing to do with it. It's literally one of the funniest, funniest <laughs> things. Like if we would have won the World Series and then came back for like a, you know, meet the fans in there, that is definitely coming up. In yeah. Got to bring talks. the dildo to the uh, the ceremony when you're driving through the street and just wave it in the air a little yeah. bit. One of those. It's so great. It's so lovely. I miss when our biggest problems were dildos, but we're, we're long past that. Is that a is that a pun? We're long past the nice. The I didn't even know this. It's very nice. <laughs> it's been a long, hard road since. I then. am a father of two, so dad jokes are are all my way. Oh yeah, it's my forte as well. I'm just I'm a little ahead of my time in that regard. I think. I yes yes. I'm just so happy we won a we won a series. We had a huge homer from from Conforto. Really good performances. The bullpen looks great as usual. Um, you know, it, it was, I was a little bit worrisome because of how much work these guys have put in, in the bullpen. You think there's a little bit of a lull, but it usually comes in the dog days of August, because when you hit September, you get your rosters expanded and that allows you to kind of fill in those innings when the teams aren't playing well by not using your best guys. And I was worried going down the stretch that these guys would be overworked and they've done nothing, but tell me that they're fine because they look great and even better than they did earlier in the season and they've been tremendous all year so that's exciting yeah but that's what i want our listeners to take away there's a dumb news controversy but we we did our job we won two out of three we're headed into a series to do our job again uh the bats look like they're waking up and we're facing lesser competition so just keep your head forward ignore the lull mets around you and just keep winning series because you never know what will come of it um it remains to be seen but still some teams might be slowing up we could be speeding up. You never know. But yeah, just just win, baby. Just it'll, win. It'll make it'll make everything else disappear. Just no one's win. gonna care if you win. No one's gonna care about that thumbs down if you win. But anyways, uh, this is actually a loaded day in Mets history. August thirtieth. I got a couple bylines here. All of them pretty good. Uh, if you're a true Mets fan, you know back in 1999, our wild card year. Edgardo Alfonso was a big middle of the lineup bat for us. Huge offensive piece. He had the first six hit game in Mets history on this day in 99. Three bombs, five RBIs, and six runs scored against the Astros. First player in franchise history to get those six hits. Also on this day, back in 2015, we got one of my favorite relievers of all time in a Mets uniform, although his tenure was short. Addison Reed was a godsend for us because that was a bullpen that was not as dominant as 2021 for sure. He came over from the Diamondbacks. Had a 1.17 ERA in 17 appearances, and we're going to pitch three seasons with us. So I, I love Addison. His career pretty much faded after he left us, so I, I always remember him as a Met, even though he played for numerous other teams. And then also in 1991, former Met David Cohn, who would also be a former Yankee later on, he became the first Mets pitcher since Nolan Ryan uh, to throw an immaculate inning. And I'm sure we've had some since. I just don't know him off the top of my head. But this was a loaded day in Mets history brought to you by at NYM History on Twitter. So thank you. Thanks to him for uh, pulling those uh, up for me. Yes, thank you. Uh, a second. I just wanted to Addison Reed, one of the best teammates of all time. Oh, right. You played with him. I totally forgot. He's one of the he is a tremendous human being, lovely father, husband, just a fun guy to have in your clubhouse. It was an honor to share the bullpen with him because he truly is just one of those glue guys that keeps your team together really funny, really genuine, and just will take a bullet for anybody on that team. Love it. Uh, he is happy in retirement. I saw him in 2019 or 2020, right after he retired, uh, just ran into him in Scottsdale mall on the way in. And I was like, gave him a big hug. Love that guy. Uh, tremendous human, his whole family, they moved from Ohio. He was living in Ohio as well, moved out back to, to Arizona, but 
Uh, shout out to him. And you talked about the immaculate inning. Did you see Chris Sale hit his had his third one? I did actually. Yeah, that guy. It's good to see him back. You know, if there's I'm Team Skinny guy. Degrom is the captain of Team Skinny guy from the right hand side. Chris Sale, captain from the left side. Oh, for sure. Skinny lefties. Skinny lefties. Then Kevin Durant is the basketball. <laughs> you know, our figure. It's a nice call out. And yeah, the, the one thing for Addison Reed that I always loved was that he'd always tip his cap up after he was walking back from a nice outing. I just I don't know why he did it, but I loved it every time I saw it. It's so, like, iconic of him. Maybe we should get him on Shea Station if you guys are still buddies. I don't know. Call him in from Arizona. He doesn't like media. He doesn't like us. He probably he defriended me. He, he might have blocked me on our, our text. I'll shoot wow. him a text. Yeah, I get why he doesn't like media, though. This, this episode is case in point. Not that he doesn't like it. He just quiet. Sure. Doesn't want to create ripples, doesn't want to create headlines. Like, hey, it'll be fine. Well, and of course, we got to close out with my uh, Jog and Jerry's memory segment. And again, just like last episode, kind of tough to find a game for this day. There was only one. Again, only one. August 30th, 2010, going way, way back. Oakland A's days, again. Two scoreless innings of relief against the beloved New York Yankees. Very nice for Jer. You struck out both Jorge Posada and, how dare you, Curtis Granderson. You should always let Curtis tee up because he's the man of the hour. I love Curtis. <laughs> uh, that was in an 11-5 loss for the Athletics. Uh, but you went two scoreless innings pretty nice. One of your earlier seasons. Something to pull away there? Love it. That's two quality names for punch outs. Now. Yeah, for sure. And two innings. Who, who, would, who would remember that I went more than one hitter at a time? Because, yeah, that was back in the days of the situational lefty. I did I did throw two innings for the Mets uh, in a start against the Dodgers. Which I had forgot about and then was called not a true Mets fan. I just want to say. I know, man. It's That's a little brutal. outlandish. It seems like a little. But uh, I have no recollection of that. I have faced Curtis Granderson many times in my career. He hit me for a homer a couple of times in Yankee Stadium, like one that I, I vividly remember going, oh, man, that went really far. Um, but majority, like, I'm, I've done well against him, and I make sure to tell him anytime we get a chance. Were they short porch dinks, or were they, like, bombs? Oh, no. they Yeah, he made sure. He didn't need the short porch. He, he could have done that. You know, I faced him when he was with the Tigers. They would have went out in, in Comerica, so it wouldn't have. Yeah, Comerica is a tough place to hit a homer, so good on Curtis there. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, we talk about how good Miguel Cabrera is. During his heyday, uh, he would have hit, like, 75 home runs if he was a Yankee. Oh, yeah, I know. Because he, he would go oppo with ease. Yeah. Easy. And that, that gap in, like, right center field in Detroit is ridiculous. And then all of a sudden, the, the fence is, like, super high. But we're I'm getting sidetracked here. You got to keep me on task. Crack the whip when you need to, Jolly. Oh, no. Come on. I got to let you go. I just got to let you spin out, you know. You eventually come around. You realize it. I've got my hat. I've got my Cincinnati Bengals, by the way. Uh, football season's about ready to start. I've got some big fantasy drafts coming up. Wow. You're a Bengals fan? That's Are tough. you in our fantasy league? Uh, I am. Fantasy league? I'm in the John Boy Media Office League with, with 16 teams. Are you kidding 16 me? 16 teams. I don't even know how to approach this. this if you mess up your incredible. first three picks, you're done for. Like, your season is over because there's nothing after that. So gosh, that's going to be, that's going to be tough, but I love fantasy football right now. I've got my Bengals hat tipped back in honor of Addison Reed. So that's, nice. that's for our boy. Tough being a Bengals fan, but I respect it. Joe Burrow. Uh, yeah, we, we got Jamar Chase, Joe Mixon. We got some, we got some, it's Is Joe Mixon ever North. really going to come through though. I feel like every season it's injury or underperformance. He's been good, but like Football's he's got, tough. It is. Yeah, so um, we've got a tough division. The, the The Ravens are really good. The Browns made the playoffs. The Pit, the Steelers made the playoffs. You've got Lamar Jackson in Baltimore. It's a tough, it's a tough division. But our uniforms are still the sickest in the game. All right, I respect that. I can just, I can only root for one miserable team at a time. The Mets are like my capacity. So, what's right who's your football team? I like watching football. I, I I've never been attached to like a fandom in football. Like so you know, your fantasy football team. I'm a fantasy football guy, like first and foremost for sure. But like, I'll, I'll watch the Giants and Jets and root for them to win. They've just been kind of sorry teams to watch the past few years. But I'm not an authority on football knowledge. I just like playing fantasy football. That's really it. I'm the same way. Like I love football, but like 
I don't know enough about it. Like, the, if I, have you played Madden in the last 15 years? No, I haven't played Madden in a long time. I played some of my friends who play Madden, and it's like a full-on simulation. They're calling audibles, setting up multiple plays. I'm like, dude, I just I just want to score points. I just want to throw a Hail Mary. That's it. Yeah, let Bo Jackson run down the field. I don't <laughs> care. I miss NCAA, you know, with Michael Vick, whatever the case They're may bringing be. it back, actually, NCAA. So you can get back on that. Finally. All right, we've uh, I think we've babbled long enough. I don't know I don't know how we got here, but we did. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to uh, the eighth episode or seventh ep- seventh episode, not eighth. What am I thinking? Seventh episode of Shea Station, uh, brought to you by John Boy Media. Uh, this was a doozy. Uh, it normally would have been much more positive, but of course we had plenty to discuss. And hopefully by the end of the Marlins series, we can just talk about the Mets winning games and no other media controversy. But for now. Uh, I'm Jolly Olive, a.k.a. Jack for Jump Boy Media. I'm Jerry Blevins, giving you nothing but thumbs up. Hell yeah. Thumbs up from me as well. And we will see you guys on Friday. Thanks for tuning in. Let's go Mets.